Hello everybody out there in wrestling world and welcome to another edition of Ring Respect Radio right here on the Video Bros Network. Also available as always from our friends at Backbreaker Media and all their media channels as well. Before we get the show started today we're going to go ahead and ask you to like and subscribe the video and turn on the notification bell so you know anytime we release new material right here on Ring Respect Radio. Anyways, as we get on with the show, I am Bobby Munson, and I'm joined, as always, by the man with the angelic voice. He is Papa Smokes. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing good, Munson. How are all the wrestling people doing out there? Hopefully everybody is at home listening in and having a good old time. We're sitting here. We're toasting this show with a good old scotch. We just released a new episode of Ring Respect Radio that you can check out here on the Video Bros Network. That was all about the life and times of Bullet Bob Armstrong. That was a great show that we did there, Pop Smoke. Very proud of that one. And then we had a topic come up that we thought we'd talk about here today, and this is a pretty big topic. We usually tend to go and look at the past when it comes down to guys uh, passing on and us talking about their career, but I thought we would get ahead of the curve this time and talk about somebody who's had a major impact in professional wrestling because something uh, recent that happened. We're talking today about Gerald Briscoe and about the Briscoe family lineage in professional wrestling. Uh, the reason we are bringing this up is because just recently the WWE parted ways with Gerald Briscoe, made this public, in fact, uh, letting him go from the company, age of 72, I believe, that, or 73, I believe he is, and he's been working there for over 40 years. I mean, this seems like a real kind of uh, slap in the face. What do you think on this one, Papa Smokes? Yeah, first of all, it's kind of weird to see Gerald Briscoe in the wrestling headlines in 2020, but uh, this turned out to be a big and interesting story, especially considered the uh, history involved between Briscoe and McMahon, which we'll get to in a little bit here. Definitely so. So we're going to dig really deep into Gerald Briscoe's uh, wrestling career, uh, his career therefore afterwards, once he got out, stepped outside of the ring itself, and also going to be talking in depth later on in the show about Georgia Championship Wrestling, which has a very big tie-in with the Briscoe family as well, too. So we're going to get to that very soon. So again, we want to say uh, thank you, a big thank you before we start off the show's main topic here today to uh, Backbreaker Media, who's been helping us out boost the show up. They're uh, getting us a lot of listeners there in Alberta and stuff like that. The show's taken off better than it ever has before, and... Uh, Quite personally, I'm uh, very thankful for all the love and support we've been getting from you, the listeners, and also from our friends at Backbreaker Media. So from Pop Smokes and I, thank you very much for tuning in. We appreciate everything you guys do for us. Now on to the show here. So we're going to start off with Gerald Briscoe, the wrestler. And Pop Smokes, uh, we're talking about a guy debuting in 1969, trained by his brother Jack Briscoe, and uh, moving on to be a tag team together. Uh, how can you uh, fill us in on the uh, Briscoe brothers and uh, Gerald Briscoe in particular for the wrestling career? Yeah, well, I would start even a bit earlier than that, 1969, because uh, the Briscoe brothers were from Oklahoma and uh, were uh, amateur wrestlers, Greco-Roman wrestlers in high school and college. Went to Oklahoma State. Uh, Jack, being the older brother, uh, uh, finished with his degree first and with the uh, Great degree of success in college uh, Greco-Roman wrestling. Gerald also uh, uh, a star in, in amateur wrestling in college. And then, yeah, right to 1969 where uh, uh, Jack had helped Gerald get into the business. but He had uh, gotten Gerald to sub in a couple of pro wrestling matches when Gerald hadn't been trained in that style yet. So getting kind of thrown in the pot, thrown in the fire, so to speak, and... Uh, he had to learn quick and uh, came up with his brother as a tag team. Yeah, and uh, what a tag team they made. Uh, quite a few championships between them as they uh, toured the territory days. Uh, maybe uh, tell us a little bit more about the tag team of the Bis Briscoe brothers. Uh, what were some of the main feuds that they would have had along the way and stuff like that that you can remember, Papa Smokes? Well, the Briscoe brothers as a tag team were, yeah, as you say, tremendously successful. Had... 20 championships throughout the uh, old territories, including Mid-Atlantic, uh, the, the Carolinas, Florida, Mid-South, uh, all over, mostly in the southeastern states. Uh, they were a babyface tag team pretty much completely through that. Uh, their style was the uh, very sportsmanlike, a very technical wrestling or scientific wrestling, as they used to call it in the days, all based on their greatness in amateur wrestling. So they were like uh, 
like a pair of uh, Kurt Angles, so to speak, or like uh, perhaps a more modern day uh, example of a tag team would be like uh, Shelton Benjamin and Charlie Haas. If you remember them in WWE for a while, they're just both uh, highly decorated uh, uh, amateur and Greco-Roman wrestlers that became a tag team of just slick and smooth proportions. And that, that was it for the uh, Briscoe brothers played it straight, played it by the book, and uh, as as Babyface is tremendously popular. And uh, Babyface is for most of their career, but uh, from what I was reading as well, too, took a uh, heel turn kind of closer to the end of their run inside the squared circle there. Yeah, yeah. Um, if, you know, they always say if you can do one side good, you can probably do the other side pretty good, too, but... Uh, uh, they, yeah, the their major feud, you asked about feuds, their major feud was against uh, Rick Steamboat and Jay Youngblood in the 80s, a uh, 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 two-year feud that culminated, I think, at the first Starcade card, and uh, that was uh, Briscoe still as technical, but as uh, as villains in this case, and uh, Steamboat and Youngblood as the faces, and what a tremendous uh, uh, tag team rivalry that is. Probably one of the best in the business ever, and uh, it'll go down remembered like that, too. So definitely, if anybody has an opportunity to go check out any of that work, definitely go back and do so. Uh, so the Briscoe Brothers, uh, great tag team, as you said, but also uh, known as the two guys that were, you know, the ones that introduced legendary Hulk Hogan to Hiro Matsuda for training. So they were the, responsible for Hulk Hogan really getting break, breaking into the business. Yeah, we've talked about that in some of our past episodes of Ring Respect Retro. We talked about uh, Eddie Graham in Tampa, Florida, had that gym that was called the Snake Pit, where all the shoot fighters and all the guys, all the pro wrestlers that had uh, shoot fighting experience in their background, such as the Briscoe Brothers and Hiro Matsuda, <clears throat> excuse me, and Bob Roop and a few other people, uh, would go down to that gym and practice uh, shoot fighting and uh, and uh, amateur wrestling as well as working on their pro style. But uh, it was a rough gym and it was known for some rough behavior and you had to be one of the tough guys in the wrestling biz to hang out there. And hence why young Terry Bollet wanted to go in there and get trained by the guys. And uh, as you all know, the legend, it didn't go so great at first for uh, young Hulk Hogan, the uh, Matsuda worked him over, stretched him, and broke his leg the first time they met. But Hogan was tough, and he came back, and uh, they showed that he was tough. So they, Matsuda and the boys down at the uh, state snake pit agreed to train Hogan, and that way you got you got uh, the best kind of training you can get for professional wrestling and how you have to be tough. Well, not just about how to be tough, but that was the way that they made sure that you weren't just somebody that was uh, going to be a one-off either. They wanted to make sure you were somebody that they would tell the secret of the business to because at the time, kayfabe still very much alive and they had to protect that. And in doing so, they had to make you believe what they were doing inside that squared circle was 100% real. And that's what Hulk Hogan was led to believe. I believe reading his uh, autobiography there as well too, that when he came back that second time and had that conversation and found out that wrestling was staged and everything like that, it kind of really uh, it shook his world quite a bit too because he was made to believe otherwise. So, but yes, you know his legend went on, and the Briscoe is very responsible for getting him in there. Uh, but not just responsible for the tag team legacy that they left behind. Jerry Briscoe himself, a fantastic singles competitor as well too, and even going as far as defeating Les Thornton in 1981 to become the NWA World Junior Champion. Yeah, not a bad uh, spot to have there. That that. In those southern states, even that junior championship was kind of similar to what maybe the intercontinental or U.S. title is these days. If you had that, you were on the radar for possibly getting a world title shot. So having that belt was great, but don't forget Jack Briscoe, uh, Jerry's older brother, was NWA world champ for a time, beating Harley Race and uh, had a fairly historic reign of 500-some days to which of course, is unheard of now, but uh, Jack Briscoe rising to the top of the singles ranks as well. Now, the Briscoe brothers, they, you know, they had the tag teams, they had the singles competition. We've discussed some of that, of course, too, and uh, made a real name for themselves inside the squared circle. But they've also left a legacy outside of the in-ring work as well, too. And we're going to get really in-depth on this part of it and everything. Uh, first, we're going to mention that the Briscoe brothers eventually became shareholders in what was known as Georgia Championship Wrestling. 
And there was a bit of a power struggle, if I'm not mistaken, that we'll go over in a little bit here. But the power struggle allowed the Briscoe brothers to gain majority shares in the company of Georgia Championship Wrestling and allowed them to inevitably sell the company to Vince McMahon, leading to what was inevitably known in the wrestling world as Black Saturday. And we're going to get more into Black Saturday here, Papa Smokes. I know that we've had a look at the show of Black Saturday on YouTube before. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the matches from there and what that meant when you saw Vince McMahon walk out on television at Georgia Championship Wrestling. Before we do, let's talk a little bit more further about uh, Gerald Briscoe and his career uh, beyond Black Saturday and beyond the ring because he chose to go and follow Vince McMahon and the WWF in that sale. That was part of the deal that Jack and Jerry Briscoe were going to be given contracts to go and work for the WWF. And, of course, Jerry obviously worked there for over 40 years, uh, joined them in 1984, and then went on to, in uh, some people might remember from the late 90s, early 2000s, the Attitude Era of WWE, uh, becoming one of Vince McMahon's stooges in what was known as a very popular role, um, winning multiple hardcore championships and working alongside former first-time Intercontinental Champion Pat Patterson as well. Yeah, yeah, they had their uh, little almost a faction of uh, the guys that worked behind the scenes there. Uh, what were they called? McMahon Stooges or something like that? Yes, Lunson, sir, yeah. I, I believe so. And uh, it was a kind of a funny little spot, I suppose. There would have still been some viewers that remembered Patterson and Briscoe as wrestlers, I suppose, but... Uh, uh, yeah, he, he they were doing uh, ring agenting, uh, uh, some booking uh, activities in WWE at that time. And uh, yeah, he hung in there and did a good job. He was one of uh, McMahon's trusted men, al along with Pat Patterson, uh, that uh, could just knew the business inside out, knew what was good, knew what wasn't, knew what looked good in the ring and what didn't, and uh, he, his uh, his influence on the company was definitely felt in a positive way all throughout that backstage work. Definitely so, and, uh, and with everything that he accomplished and did inside the ring and outside, it also led to his induction into the WWE Hall of Fame in 2008. But it's not just what uh, he's brought to the table as well, too, but a lot of people may be unfamiliar, and maybe our listeners are unfamiliar <laughs> with a certain uh, wrestler who is currently on the scene today named Wes Briscoe, and that is the son of Gerald Briscoe. And for those who are unfamiliar, he is currently the champion of Atomic Revolutionary Wrestling, and he also participated in TNA Wrestling. Uh, some people might remember him as one of the reveals of the group Aces and Eights in TNA Wrestling. Yeah, isn't that a famous legacy to have, too? He was in Aces and Eights. <laughs> That was a great time, and definitely anybody who hasn't checked that out should definitely go back and watch that. And, you know, maybe give TNA Impact Wrestling a try. They've still got some great content over there, some great wrestling, and they did in the past as well, too. A great company that's, you know, fallen by the wayside in very unfortunate matters and stuff, too. I think that maybe they need a little bit of a, uh, little bit of a revival from modern-day wrestling fans because there is a lot of great talent over there, including guys like Wes Briscoe, who definitely could have made a bigger impact in wrestling. Uh, given the opportunity, I believe. And now we're going to talk about one last thing and something maybe uh, if you're just more of a younger fan or just recently tuning into professional wrestling, Gerald Briscoe, if you're unfamiliar, might have you might have seen him just recently as the winner of the 24-7 championship over in WWE. The last title that Gerald Briscoe has hold is a professional wrestler, the 24-7 championship. We could have a little laugh about it, but I mean at the age of 73, you can't really knock it. They had an opportunity. He had a little bit of fun with it. And, you know, good for him for getting that chance. Yeah, it shows that he's uh, valued and respected in the locker room, too, that they wanted to give him uh, a little fun spot to have on TV with a little fun title that they have going there. And why not have a good laugh uh, of Gerald Briscoe popular behind the scenes with uh, the boys the wrestlers, so to speak, and, uh, and uh, yeah, why not have some fun with it, right? Yeah, and I believe it was very reminiscent of the same way that he won the Hardcore Championship as well, too, and everything back in the uh, late 90s there. So, you know, great time for Gerald Briscoe, a great competitor inside the squared circle, a great businessman as well, too. And we're going to go back to the business side. I said that we would come back to Black Saturday and Papa Smokes. I'm really going to let you take the reins on this one because you probably remember a lot more than I do on this. But we have looked into it quite a bit. We're talking Black Saturday and the sale of GCW over to Vince McMahon and the WWE and what went down that day. 
Yeah, first off, I, I'll give you a little bit of background on Georgia Championship Wrestling, just in case you don't know, but this was the big American wrestling TV show in the 70s and 80s, uh, bigger than WWE because it had a, a national satellite deal in the 70s so that uh, people with the satellite dishes in the old days could get this show anywhere in the country. It didn't just have the local broadcast zone, but could be seen all over the country. And not to interrupt you, Papa Smokes, but I believe the first NWA promotion to be broadcast nationally as of 1976. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, uh, they had they were able to get uh, such an incredible roster of talent at this time too. Um, they have, when you read a list of uh, who's been in the roster for uh, uh, any length of time at all, it, it's really kind of uh, mind-boggling. But I'll go through a few here. The the Andersons, the Anderson brothers, uh, Arn, Ole, and and Lars, and then also the Armstrong family, who we just recently talked about, Bob and his sons, Buzz and Brett Sawyer, the Briscoe brothers, Abdullah the Butcher, Ted DiBiase, Jim Duggan, Junkyard Dog, Dusty Rhodes, Ric Flair, The Funks, Wahoo McDaniel, Magnificent Morocco, Paul Orndorff, Tommy Rich, Rick Steamboat, Mr. Wrestling 2, Magnum TA. If you look at this, you just can see where the uh, the superstars of American wrestling were being made there. You can also notice a few that Vince picked up after this time as well with his uh, deep pockets up in New York there. He pinched uh, quite a few of these guys for his own promotion, but uh, make no mistake about it, this, this show was very well done, very, very popular throughout the country, and uh, the people that watched it uh, treated it like their home promotion. They came on at uh, 6.05 every Saturday night, and uh, this was uh, like a religion to some people. I know it was like that in my house uh, when I was a kid, uh, not with Georgia Championship Wrestling, but with the wrestling program in general. And that's what it was. this was like. They had uh, Ole Anderson as the booker, which he was later a booker in WCW as well, and uh, lots of angles, lots of great feuds, lots of great matches. Um, they started doing uh, big shows in the Omni in Atlanta, which was kind of their home ground. They would have their uh, sort of pay-per-view, so to speak, uh, quality big shows there. And uh, this was an incredibly popular show. That's why when uh, uh, in July of 84, when Black Saturday happened, it was just such a tremendous shock to the fans and viewers. And we're not just talking a... Uh show that it only aired for a couple of years as well, too. I believe the first airing of GCW on television was uh, Christmas Day, 1971, and it ran from there till 1984, when Vince McMahon inevitably took it over on Black Saturday as well, too. Uh, but yeah, let's uh, let's dig a little deeper into Black Saturday and what that meant to the wrestling world. Uh, what happened that day exactly, Papa Smokes? Let's, uh, let's let the listeners... Imagine that they're sitting down in front of the tel television right now, tuning in to Georgia Championship Wrestling, and what occurs that on that episode? Okay, well, uh, nothing was known to any of the viewers, but at 6.05 Saturday, that coveted time slot that they were all fighting over, Vince McMahon walks out onto the set of Georgia Championship Wrestling, where normally it would have been Gordon Soley, the beloved and, and famous announcer that, uh, that everybody liked so much, and was like the Walter Cronkite of the wrestling world. His his word was golden. Instead of Gordon Soley coming out, here comes Vince McMahon. This is Junior, of course, the Vince we know. Uh, not long having taken control of his father's company uh, in, in the past year or two and, and with uh, eyes on expansion. And uh, he knew that the biggest show that he wanted to acquire was uh, uh, Georgia Championship Wrestling and that, that whole territory which was doing huge numbers for wrestling sales uh, on the homegrown stars that, that I listed before and many, many others as well. So McMahon walks out, starts telling everyone, yes, we've got WWF wrestling going on here, and uh, he introduces a couple of uh, interview packages and then starts showing some WWF content from the time in 1984. Uh, some of these matches... It's really quite something to watch. He doesn't even give quality matches to this uh, new program that he's acquired, but first match is Adrian Adonis and Dick Murdoch versus Dick DiCarlo and Special Delivery Jones in a non-title match. 
Next match is Jesse Ventura versus Chris Curtis. Next match is Iron Sheik versus Ron Hutchison. This is superstars versus preliminary talent, which uh, used to be more the way in, in wrestling TV shows, but uh, this was not what Georgia Championship fans were used to watching in the least because they had a studio show where the matches would take place in front of the studio audience, similar to how NWA does it these days. And the promos are done in front of the live audience and everything. This was all packages of, quite frankly, extremely boring matches uh, filmed from the middle card of house shows uh, up in the Northeast. And uh, the fans in Georgia and, and their fan base were just absolutely taken aghast. This was a culture shock of the highest degree. This was not what they wanted, not what they expected. They wanted their roster of, uh, of uh, familiar stars and uh, had a great lineup as good as McMahon's was any day. But what a shock to the fans when uh, to realize that your show has been taken over by its competition without any warning. You sit down to watch it and here's McMahon's got it under his wing right there. And now let's uh, let's go a little bit off the beaten path here. This is not something I necessarily put down in my jot notes, but let's uh, talk a little bit about the comparison between Vince McMahon Jr. walking out on Georgia Championship Wrestling that day in the takeover of Georgia Championship Wrestling to something maybe our listeners might be a little bit more familiar with, and that was the time when they tuned into Monday Night Raw and watched as Shane McMahon simultaneously walked out to the ring over on World Championship Wrestling in the takeover of WWE and WCW. Yeah, quite similar, I think. Uh, I remember being shocked myself when uh, the McMahons uh, eventually took control of WCW and uh, had Monday Nitro, and the, it just starts live with Shane McMahon walking to the ring. It was like, oh, Jesus, we got something going on here, so some major business dealings in the background that we didn't know about it. Probably a similar feeling, although uh, I think uh, McMahon's dealt with the purchase of WCW more more effectively than they did with than with uh, Georgia Championship Wrestling because uh, Vince Vince's show in Georgia Championship Wrestling was just absolutely a, a failure in that time slot. The uh, the fans didn't take to it at all, and, and it, he ended up having to sell it uh, after that too. And it now seems like there's been two times in history that Vince McMahon has kind of messed around with Ted Turner in that sense because Georgia Championship Wrestling, uh, we were uh, talking before the show went on the air, actually was airing on WTBS before it became the Superstation, which was owned by Ted Turner and company. And when Vince McMahon took over, he felt that he was going to get a collection of great WWF-based matches with a lot of the big-name superstars. Instead, he was basically fed, like you said, a lot of mid-card talent, a lot of dark matches, and a lot of stuff that wasn't going to make Vince McMahon's regular WWF programming, and therefore Ted Turner was very upset with that. Eventually, uh, from what I read, GCW eventually renamed as Georgia Championship Wrestling, or, uh, sorry, WWF Georgia Championship Wrestling, or something like that. And then inevitably, that's where they came up with the idea of World Championship Wrestling spawned from that eventually. But that came as an offshoot once Ted Turner needed wrestling back on his programming once he lost the deal with Vince McMahon and company. Yeah, and Ted Turner was a fan of wrestling too. Uh, as much of a business mogul as he was and such, and, and a communications business uh, uh, big shot, he, he always wanted to have a wrestling show on his channel because he believed it was good ratings, he believed it was good comment content, and he also personally liked it. So uh, when he got when he uh, got wind that McMahon was showing kind of his his uh, cutting room floor scraps, so to speak, on the uh, on the network, he was furious, and uh, he he wanted a good product on there. Hence the the formation of the, the WCW out out of the ashes of what had been there before. Definitely so, and you know it's been uh, quite a ride uh, reading all about this Georgia Championship Wrestling. If anybody. Uh, wants to take the time to go back and watch like a wonderful programming from the 70s and 80s. I highly suggest hitting up YouTube. There is a lot of the collection of the Georgia Championship Wrestling stuff on there. I'm certain that because of the sale of it, you can also find all that material on the WWE Network. So if you have that WWE Network that you're already paying for, that you're kind of complaining about the modern stuff you're getting, well, why don't you dig deeper into that network 
and have a look at where wrestling came from and get familiar with Georgia Championship Wrestling and the way they used to build wrestling superstars back in the 70s and 80s leading up to what you know of professional wrestling today. Um, before we move on, I'm uh, going to do a bit of a free fall, free for all here, I think, for the last bit. We're just going to shoot the shit on some uh, pro wrestling uh, from today, Papa Smokes. Uh, anything else you want to add about Jerry Briscoe, the Briscoe family, or uh, Georgia Championship Wrestling? Yeah, I just wanted to make it clear about uh, that when McMahon first bought Georgia Championship Wrestling, he bought, uh, he ended up getting majority shares from Jack Briscoe, Gerald Briscoe, and, uh, and, uh, uh can't think of his name at the oh Jim Barnett the uh, the famous promoter Jim Barnett and uh, that that way he uh, he got the majority shares of the company but one of the promises he made which was probably a handshake deal was that uh, Jack and Jerry Briscoe would have jobs for life life with him in New York in WWF so that's kind of the ironic thing about uh, Gerald's recent firing here of course he did last forty some years but. Uh, I guess uh, McMahon, when it comes to business, isn't going to honor that handshake agreement, and uh, and maybe he maybe he talked it over with Briscoe first. Maybe he didn't, but uh, yeah, the job for life didn't really turn out that way, and that's kind of the irony of what what some why some people are talking about uh, Briscoe's termination recently. Definitely so, and I believe uh, as we head into the free for all, I want to talk a little bit about. Just anything we can think of off the cuff about professional wrestling here. But uh, I kind of leading into that with something I saw on Twitter from Gerald Briscoe himself saying that he was excited for Wednesday night, which made a lot of people start to speculate that there could be a possibility Gerald Briscoe going over and doing some work with AEW, maybe behind the scenes or something like that. Uh, what are your thoughts? What uh, benefit could AEW have from bringing some of the likes of Gerald Briscoe onto their show? Well, yeah, I'm not sure about that rumor or anything like that, but I, I think it would be a, a great thing for any company to have a man of, of Briscoe's uh, pedigree and of his uh, experience and knowledge in the business to have, uh, I suppose he would be a backstage agent or possibly helping with booking, which they could certainly use, and uh, he would just, he would be invaluable. It's like having a Hall of Famer, or it is having a Hall of Famer in your backstage, helping the guys with their ring work, helping the guys with their promos. And I'm sure he learned quite a bit about television production while he was working with uh, WWE as, as well, and that's always valuable. So I, I would say that would be a good acquisition if he's interested in still working in the business for any length of time at his age. Perfect. That's going to wrap up everything about uh, kind of the Briscoe family and everything like that. I hope everybody goes and checks that out. But now I just want to do something a little bit different here on Ring Respect Radio today. Because a lot of the times before we get started here on the program, Bob and Smokes and I sit around. We kind of shoot the shit about pro wrestling, whether it be modern stuff, classic <clears throat> stuff, everything like that. Uh, that is kind of like outside of our own personal jot notes and outside of the research and everything that we do. And we thought maybe it would be a little bit of fun here today. To end this episode of Ring Respect Radio with just a discussion of pro wrestling in general and stuff like that. So I just kind of wanted to go over some of the stuff that we've seen from uh, recent uh, comments from pro wrestling, uh, what's going on. Uh, we talked in length last week, our last episode about MLW, the restart. We're happy about seeing them come back. That's uh, as far as modern wrestling goes. That's one of the best things you can tune into. Uh, looking forward to that. But other big news, Papa Smokes, I read... NWA is making a comeback here shortly. Yeah, so happy to hear that because it, there were many rumors and speculation that the company was in a lot of financial trouble, which would be understandable during the COVID uh, shutdown. Uh, they they were putting a great emphasis on the uh, health of their performers and their staff and everybody else. So it's good that when the uh, companies that had the integrity to stay shut down during the COVID uh, crisis both for the health of their fans and their uh, performers. Yeah, I don't want to see those companies suffer financially, but that, that's kind of the way it works out sometimes. But uh, glad to hear it. If they're going to get back going, uh, I like the NWA as a product. I like their mission statement. And uh, uh, they put out a good brand of wrestling, which is quite reminiscent of what we were just talking about, Georgia Championship Wrestling. I swear that's that same ring, months, and it sounds... Uh, so loud uh, uh, and so perfect. I just love that ring. It sounds like the exact same one from Georgia Championship. But anyway, I wish the uh, NWA all the best, and I can't wait till they get back. 
Yeah, and it's uh, going to be in a different fashion. It's not going to be the weekly programming on YouTube that they were given away before. So this isn't NWA power we're talking about. These are going to be more pay-per-view-like events, kind of like what uh, TNA, I guess, Impact did when they were first starting out. So there's uh, currently a, uh, a, a tier. You can buy per each pay-per-view event or each event that they're going to be hosting, or else you can buy a four-pack bundle and get four of the events for a uh, reduced price. So we hope everybody out there takes the time Give the NWA some money and show them some love and support. Uh, let's talk about that title match that we've got coming up from the NWA. Papa Smokes, I'm a big fan of Nick Aldis. I know you are as well, too. Been a great NWA World Champion and been endorsed by many of the legends to hold the 10 pounds of gold. Coming up against Stu Bennett, I believe, is what he's going under. I know he's Mike Bennett, Stu Bennett. I, I can't quite remember. I know he's gone by both, but this is who we're getting. Bennett is going to be going up against Aldis for the championship. What are your thoughts on this match? Okay, is it, um, it's not Stu Bennett though, Munson, is no. it? Because he's the announcer, isn't it? Uh, Sorry, Stu, yeah, that's the Stu. guy that used to be woo, woo, woo. Uh, no, no, we're uh, not that, him. That's not him either. Uh, we're talking about uh, Mike Bennett. This is Mike and Maria yeah, yeah. Canellis yes, from yes, WWE. Yes. So Mike Canellis, uh, aka Mike Bennett, I believe is his actual name that right, he goes right. by. Uh, this is who is going to be going into the ring against Nick Aldis. And now everything I've always seen with him personally has been more WWE related more in the recent times. I did see some of his work from the independents prior to him signing to WWE. The guy can go inside the ring. So once they released him, I was kind of curious to see where it would lead. And man, I I'm impressed that he chose the NWA path and he's going for the 10 pounds of gold with Nick Aldis. I think this is going to be a great wrestling match. Yeah, I think so too. And uh, Bennett looks Real good. I've been seeing pictures of him on uh, online. He's he's a physical specimen of some uh, impressiveness, and uh, I think this guy's uh, since he's he wanted to get away from WWE and and kind of the stifling nature of that company he didn't like. So I think some of these guys like him and John Moxley are able to find new life in wrestling after uh, after the dub, and I think this is one of those guys that's going to come out swinging and coming out coming out to make an impression, coming out to impress some people uh, after his, uh, you know, kind of petering out in WWE. I think this guy's looking for a good match. They're having it out in uh, Los Angeles area too, which is kind of interesting, which is quite outside of the NWA's uh, territory. I think even that might be the first or one of the first defenses of that uh, globed dome NWA belt that that has occurred on the west coast uh, in that area so that's kind of an interesting part to it too I, I'm looking forward to it they built it up as a has a big fight feel to it and uh, I wish them all the best in uh, getting a lot of views and making some cash and making some uh, progress back to leaping back into the wrestling market uh, sort of post-covid I guess have you been watching some of the uh, promos done between all this and uh and Bennett as well, too, uh, the leading up to this match. I know I tuned in recently. I mean, all this always carries himself well as a champion and always talks extremely well, makes it you interested in the uh, fight and everything like that. But I think it was the opposite side with, from Bennett that I was uh, more impressed with and him talking about his love for professional wrestling and how, you know, it kind of like you mentioned about it petering out and stuff like that in the WWE. And he could have taken that opportunity to go, you know, sign for the money with AEW or try to go and make some money with somebody else and stuff like that. And his wife, Maria, actually looked at him and said to him, what is going to make you happy? What if money didn't matter, what would make you happy? And that would be getting into professional wrestling for professional wrestling and no better way to do it than go after the real world's champion, Nick Aldis and the 10 pounds of gold. Yeah, I can't agree with you there. And that that's probably the sign of a lifetime and long time wrestling fan too. I, I, that's an interesting story about Maria Canellis too, because be, uh, and his answer very telling too that if money really didn't matter, well, that's the belt you want is that NWA belt. That's the one that all the greats held in the past. That's the one with the history and the prestige. Now it's not the big money belt anymore with the uh, WWE uh, colossus uh, juggernaut of a corporation kind of thing, but. Uh, in your heart's heart as a wrestling fan and, and as a little kid, that's probably the belt that everybody would, would like to, not not everybody, I guess, but that the real wrestling fans would dream of wearing around their waist as an actual champion. And cheers to him for that. 
definitely. So it's going to be a great matchup. Looking forward to it. And at this point, I say it's hard to call because Nick Aldis has held that title for so long. He's been a great world's champion. And you, you don't foresee him necessarily getting the title taken off of him just out of nowhere like this. But, I mean, he's coming up, in my opinion, against affordable, affordable uh Losing my words here, Papa Smokes, but he's coming up against a very tough challenge and somebody who, you know, the way they built this up makes you actually believe there is that slight bit of opportunity or slight chance we could see a championship change in the NWA coming up. Yeah, and it, that's totally right. And I think this whole COVID thing has yeah, a lot of wrestlers have had a lot of time off and uh, uh, depending on what your workout regimen is and your training regimen maybe some people are rusty maybe some people are a little bit soft i don't know about these guys but i mean it's the perfect time that an upset could occur i think and that there could be a new champ maybe the company uh, feels like things could be shook up too i i don't know but we'll see in this uh, big nwa title match and uh, i'm just glad to see that belt and that title getting some uh, recognition and, and getting some of that prestige that it's always had but it's kind of lacking in modern day. Speaking of the NWA championships, uh, we recently saw uh, NWA women's champion Thunder Rosa getting some television time outside of the NWA. She appeared on the AEW event All Out. I know that uh, I went back and uh, had a look at all the matches from that uh, particular night, and we call this Ring Respect Radio for a reason, so I'm only going to talk about this match in particular. So uh, Thunder Rosa taking on the AEW champion. You know what? Okay, I'm... I mean, I probably shit on AEW quite a bit and stuff like that. There is some good things over there, just like there is in any company. There's people who work for these companies that are doing a good job and stuff that we can enjoy. Their women's champion, I mean, all the credit to them. They've built their champion up strong. She's going on a long streak. She's holding the title. She's having solid matches. That is a good thing for any champion in any company, despite your feelings about the company as a whole. Uh, Thunder Rosa gets brought in. She comes in, picks up a win on their regular Dynamite channeling. Then heads out to the pay-per-view, the NWA champion versus the AEW champion. And while I'm personally more of a fan of Thunder Rosa and, you know, love to see Thunder Rosa get in there, lock up and take some wins. I, you know, I think in the back of my mind, I already knew that Thunder Rosa wasn't going to be walking away the new AEW women's champion at the same time. But they did not make her look weak here. She went in, she had a very competitive, strong match. What many are calling the best match, if not the only good match of the entire card. And, you know, in many ways was made to look very, very strong and did not weaken the image of the NWA or their championship belt either. Yeah, I I was really surprised and thought that was a great thing when it was happening. I'm also a fan of Thunder Rosa and uh, her work in the NWA and the the long road she took to uh, unseating Allison Kay for that championship. But um, when she came in to battle... uh, Cheetah, the AEW women's champion, that's that's another one of these kind of super matches. It's champion versus champion. You don't see that so often, especially with the major leagues these days, or really very seldom at all. I know that uh, AEW has had some, and ROH have also had, had some dealings with Aldis and the NWA in the past little while. Uh, Aldis had a thing going on with Marty Skrull, and then he's also... Uh, made a title defense and, and lost the belt to Cody Rhodes on that very first uh, AEW uh, pay-per-view that they did a couple of years ago. But um, yeah, I think this helps NWA a lot. I think it'll help get some eyeballs onto their product. And uh, uh, Thunder Rosa, a, a perfect uh, ambassador for the NWA that came to, uh, to came to the rival promotion AEW with some fire with some conviction and then some great skill in the ring and uh put on a he- heck of a match uh, definitely the match of that pay-per-view and uh yeah always good representing women's wrestling getting it out there at a high level um getting the fans uh, eyeballs on on the women's wrestling as a product and some without any championships having to uh change hands we had a top level ladies match there and that's that's just good for the business all around yes definitely so and uh, credit to both women that were involved in that matchup definitely earning uh the right to say that they had the best match of that entire night uh we'll talk about one other thing from that particular night i know that uh you're not going to spend a whole lot of time on the AEW frontier but you know speaking about champions and making them look strong uh i'm not going to go out on a limb and say i'm a huge john moxley fan by any sense of the word but 
the bringing of him into AEW was not necessarily a bad thing for that company. Bringing him in, he brings along that name status. He's worked for the big guys in WWE. So it's definitely a good acquisition. Um, they made him the champion. And I mean, if you're going to have a guy come in and beat a guy at the level of Chris Jericho, become your champion, book him strong. And I got to credit AEW in that sense. John Moxley has been booked strong uh, in doing so. He's also ranked up as PWI's uh, to number one of the top 500 wrestlers in the world today. And, uh, you know, he had that match with MJF. It was a decent, strong match. Uh, a couple of things I didn't care for in that particular match and everything. And I love MJF, would have loved to see him as a champion. And I feel maybe the company had somewhat of a missed opportunity to give a middle finger to McMahon and the WWE to say, we finally rose somebody to the top that was not from your company to begin with, with MJF. But again, maybe that's not the right time just yet to take the title, bounce it off of Moxley, and go with somebody else at this current time. Because again, after Moxley, who did MJF really have in the way that's, you know, got the build up and strong enough to go after him and give him a good run as the champion? I think that they maybe need to build some more star power before they give a good, strong, solid title run to a guy as young as MJF. Yeah, I think you're right about that, too. I, I like MJF a whole bunch. I think he's a magnificent heel uh, in the whole wrestling, uh, in all the companies combined. He's one of the top heels. Great talker, great worker. Uh, his look and his image is just fantastic. But I, I think you're right about that. It, they, they don't have to rush, and they shouldn't rush. I think this uh, build-up with MJF should uh, be maybe him chasing the title a little bit. That always gets the fans salivating for a win but he has to come close a few times and and not achieve what what his goal is so i think uh they it kind of appears that they've been uh, teasing the breakup of mjf and wardlow so that will obviously be part of the angle will it result in mjf face turn or, or a wardlow face turn we don't know at this point but the way that uh, aew runs their angles is that it never seems that anybody's uh consistently a, a hero or a villain. So, um, yeah, I, I think they could still book that championship match of Moxley versus MJF, which whichever side of the fence MJF is sitting on and still have a heck of a championship match. And I have no doubt uh, with uh, the status of MJF that he'll get there one of these days. But I think they should be patient. I, if, if that is their plan, I, I think they're doing it the right way. Uh, one of the only good booking uh, decisions I've seen in the past while, I think, is just taking their time with MJF. Definitely so. And, you know, don't get us wrong. While we're not huge, massive fans of AEW, it's not like we're looking for the company to sink. We would love to see every professional wrestling company uh, do well for themselves, make money, and allow all these people that are working hard inside that squared circle to be able to also make that kind of money as well, too. But the biggest problem is, is that, you know, being old school fans like we are, uh, there is stuff we like. We try to enjoy as much as we can from a modern era. I mean, we're both heavily involved with professional wrestling and deal with modern wrestling all the time. It's just that I think our biggest problem with AEW, I mean, I'll, I'll speak for myself anyway, is that there is a lot of too much of the same. It's a lot of goofiness, a lot of gimmick matches, and a lot of real 50-50 booking to the point where nobody looks like a star. Everybody looks like they're on the same level. And it becomes hard to really get invested into anybody there when everybody is playing on the exact same uh, field as e each other. Yeah, I can't, couldn't agree with you more. Uh, I, I think that just uh, they they need one person that's in, in control of the booking is, is what I think is the way it, it traditionally has worked properly in, in uh, wrestling companies in the past is not having uh, uh, the talent having so much decision into what they do, but a booker that says yes and no firmly on every uh, on every uh, question that comes up uh, in the booking of their angles and their matches and uh, their pay-per-views and such. Um, having uh, different people book different uh, rosters and different uh, departments in the in the company just I don't think it's a good idea. I think it's harder to make uh, coherent shows that make sense uh, and coherent matches that make sense. And, and yeah, like you say, they're they're a little more interested in the the young audience that that uh, that doesn't that has a shorter attention span that doesn't seem to need uh, all the technical wrestling uh, that that 
everyone used to have in the past at least some knowledge of uh, there's some people on their roster that really don't look like they've had any wrestling training before at all and and having them on uh, primetime national tv is just not going to be good for your program in in the future i don't think but uh this AW product isn't to my tastes whatsoever. I do watch some just to remain current. I don't troll people online uh, because I don't like it. Uh, it's not like that at all. I, I honestly think it's better when there are two major companies that compete against each other. I think the fans win out when they're competing against each other and uh, we get two good products instead of one. And uh, I, I wish them success, but... They're going to have to pull their bootstraps up in the next couple of years in order to remain relevant, I think. Definitely. So and let's uh, let's talk about that booking just for one minute. Let's uh, take a little peek behind the curtain for you, the listeners, because uh, Papa Spokes and I both involved with professional wrestling. Uh, we'll just name drop here, Prairie Pro Wrestling, of course. Uh, if you want to check out Prairie Pro Wrestling on YouTube, head on over to the Prairie Pro Wrestling YouTube channel. You can check out the work of Papa Spokes and I. And you know what? The two of us, I was... Uh, Looking into it the other day, Papa Smokes, we've called a lot of matches in our time already. Yeah. I mean, we started off as as two amateurs, really. I mean, we have no professional training when it comes to uh, talking on microphone. We have no real in-ring experience other than, I mean, we've been shown a few bumps. We've taken a day camp kind of thing like that. You know, the basics anyway, but not to say that we're professional wrestling trained. We're not on any sort of level as any of the guys who ever step in there. We just do our best to try to collect as much information as we can and do what we can. But, man, we've we've seen a lot and we've done a lot and we've had a lot of involvement. And we're going to take a little peek behind the curtain here because when it comes down to the booking, you're talking about one guy in control of the firm booking saying yes or no. We're not saying that there needs to be one guy sitting back at AEW writing down every single little storyline, every single little match and everything like that. They could still be a team, but you need one guy at the head of it all. This is the guy who's going to guide us, the most experienced guy who knows that. And in PPW, we do have that. We have one particular guy who's kind of like the guy who makes the decisions on the booking. He says, I think we should do this, 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 and this. Then we've got another guy who kind of goes backstage. He tells the guys that's how it's going to be. You know, that's what we're going to do tonight. Uh, any concerns, bring it up. But ultimately, this is how the show's going to go. That's how we run, the, run our ship there. But it's still a team collective. We do sit down as a group of five guys. Uh, sitting around having a couple drinks and sitting there going over some of these ideas in terms of long-term booking. And we talk long-term booking. It's hard to do on an independent level. We can sit down and say, hey, we want this guy to eventually be the champion and we want him to do this. But we got to understand that there is a very good possibility that six months from now, those guys won't be available to us and we won't be able to pull that off. So a lot of it comes down to making plans. This is kind of what we want to do. But here's kind of the backup plans, like how can we insert this guy if this guy becomes unavailable and stuff like that. And a lot of that has happened for Prairie Pro Wrestling and stuff like that. A lot of meetings, a lot of sitting down and making those plans. This guy versus this guy, what will happen, what will become of it. And you know what? Things change too. Sometimes the fans ultimately change everything that happens. We had ideas for guys to go out there and change their own images and stuff like that don't go out and be the same character they've been for the last 10 15 years of their career let's go out allow you the opportunity to try something different and they did and ultimately that changed some of the long-term booking for us already with prairie pro wrestling because it was very unexpected the sheer popularity of the characters of guys like say mike mcsugar and bucky mcgraw when they changed up characters and really made an impact for us inside that squared circle yeah, yeah, you, that's well put, my Monson. Is that uh, the 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 whole concept of all this is revolves around communication and the brainstorming and the sharing of ideas. And like you mentioned, we had many meetings, uh, not only in the formation of the company, but in the direction we were going to go and the style of uh, booking and the style of wrestling and and such like that. But uh, also, yeah, like you said, uh, uh, it, it's difficult uh, on the independent level. I mean. You and I have both worked for uh, other companies in the past where they you could pretty much only do booking on a show-to-show -show basis because you had to just wait until uh, you know a certain time before the show and, and kind of see who showed up and who actually made it. You'd have you might have twelve people or ten people that said they were going to make it, but maybe only nine will show up or maybe only eight will make it, and and you know stuff happens in life and. 
and uh, with traveling and such. So uh, you can't always count on a, you know, on a contracted roster to be there and uh, there's no flights and uh, rented cars and limousines and such like that. It's uh, these guys, uh, they're not just guys, these performers all have lives too and uh, have jobs and family and have to travel and, and, and a ton of things. And uh, so, yeah, you have to base it on who you think is going to be available at the time. And the long term, it, it's, it's kind of a guess or it's kind of a shot in the dark. But uh, if you can stick to your plans and you can get some good six month or, or even 12 month angles going between your live shows and your tv um you can have the fans uh, get highly invested in your in your matches and feuds and relationships and uh competitive streaks in the in the wrestling business in the company so uh yeah we do our best but uh, uh you have to work with what you've got too so it always makes it a challenge and it's a it's a good challenge one that we've totally been up to so far and we've also seen some stars rise that you know weren't in our original plans there's a lot of the times you book and it's you know you get a couple guys from out of province or something like that to travel but you want to fill that vehicle that they're traveling in so they bring along a couple that they've worked with in their particular company that they're familiar with and stuff like that that you know we're not necessarily familiar with when they first show up here and i'm going to use examples like uh, zoe sager for example jack pride uh, and the Cheetah Bear Jude Dawkins. Uh, those three in particular weren't necessarily brought in because of any name status or anything like that. They were brought in because we needed to fill some spots. And man, did they ever accelerate once they took off there. Uh, Zoe has done wonderful for us. Uh, Cheetah Bear has become a huge big fan favorite and stuff like that. And Jack Pride, just an overall great in-ring worker as well too, that's brought a lot to the table. And then you've got a guy like uh, Mitch Danger Zone Clark, who... You know, we brought him in with a lot of background of his MMA stuff and everything like that, but not a lot of people in this area knew about his professional wrestling career or what to expect from it. I mean, you could look up what he was like in the UFC or his MMA time and stuff, and you're expecting this guy to come in and be, you know, just in there uh, giving you an MMA style shoot fighting type thing inside that wrestling ring. And far from it, Mitch Clark gave us some something completely different, but I'm glad that he did pop smoke because it really elevated him in a totally different way. And if down the line he feels like changing that up and becoming that badass that we know he can be because of that MMA background, that is on the table for him as well, too. Yeah, that, that was equally surprising for me, too. I, I wasn't uh, familiar with Mitch Clark's name as a professional wrestler. And then, uh, yeah, I have to admit I was expecting more of a, a Dan Severn kind of uh, persona or maybe a Steve Blackman or some kind of... Uh, martial arts expert that was going to come in and kick people's asses with the uh, strikes and uh, vicious submission holds. And then when Mitch came in as danger zone, it surprised me, but in fact, it, it's, it's how he naturally feels. That's the character he was drawn to was the, the danger zone. He's kind of a laid back guy. He's kind of a popular, cool guy. And uh, he's got uh, fringes on his uh, colorful trunks and all that. And <clears throat> He's a baby face all the way, so I, I mean that's that's what he feels. It's best to it's best when a wrestler's character is as close to their uh, real life persona as possible. I think, and you can see that shows through clear with the uh, Danger Zone Clark. He's he's that guy, and it comes through as as genuine, and the the fans relate to that and they respond to it. Definitely so, and you know, there's more surprises in store for sure. I mean, you and I have been doing a lot of watching of. Uh, Canadian wrestling, especially in the Western provinces, and been familiar with a few more uh, the wrestlers that are available within the uh, within the travel range of what we usually hire for Prairie Pro Wrestling. And we have definitely ourselves been making some recommendations to the other part, the other people involved with the management side of Prairie Pro Wrestling, along with us. You know, names like uh, Dylan Stone, for example, both of us have brought his name up. I uh, would love to see him working in a PPW ring. I mean, we worked with him before and we both would love to see Leo London make his way back into Saskatoon and get inside a PPW ring as well, too. And then uh, Giant Orion was another one that kind of blew blew our minds a little bit. Here's a big boy that, you know, was within the range of who we would usually draw in and great opportunity with a guy like that as well, too, if he ever decides to step inside our, our squared circle. Yeah, and uh, original Marky and Heavy Metal and the, the list could go on and on. There's, there's a whole bunch of... Uh talent in that 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 alberta that famous hotbed of of 
producing wrestling talent. It's it, it's great that we are where we are too, because those guys can get a little experience coming on the road and uh, come out and do some packed show houses in uh, Saskatoon, which our parent company PPW always has, and and hopefully we can get back to very soon. And uh, I think it works out all over the if we, when we can. Uh, trade and uh and borrow talent from them and uh and uh it, again just the fans are the winners of this uh because we get to see the best wrestling action around and the saskatchewan and alberta are just like a slice of pie with some cheese it's just a perfect matchup and uh, they go together so well and and the fans love it and i think before we bring this show to an end uh i'd be wrong and not bringing this up but speaking about the talent pool in alberta uh recently top talent wrestling academy was opened up in alberta there i know that they just recently uh revealed a championship belt which is going to be available so obviously they're going to eventually be running shows of their own down the road they were the ones who had put on the uh northern alberta invitational tournament that we both enjoyed and got to see some of those wrestlers uh take off there as well too and some of the ones that we've made recommendations for uh but they're going to be running some uh camps i know one of them taking place this coming up weekend probably before this show will actually be listened to online and everything like that so that one likely is taking place already but check out top talent wrestling academy over on twitter on their social media to find out about how you can get in training with some of these guys um we're talking training with guys like michael richard blaze and heavy metal uh, two absolute legends of the Alberta wrestling uh, ring and just two general uh, legends of Canadian professional wrestling in general. Learn learn from two of the best right there. Yeah, absolutely. We've talked before about the uh, hole that was left when uh, Lance Storm Training Academy closed up when he got that job with WWE and, and left for down south. But uh, now we've got uh, Top Talent Training Academy. I think they're going to be doing a good job. Heavy metal, uh, uh, obviously a veteran that uh, wants to teach, and then he's with him getting Michael Richard Blaze and Marky and a few other uh, guest uh, and uh, camp uh, instructors in there. I mean, you're getting great, great instruction from uh, excellent professionals who have made uh, made and drawn money in the business, and uh, I, I couldn't recommend them highly enough uh, for again a a, a very uh, excellent scene for producing. Uh, uh, homegrown wrestling talent out there in uh, Edmonton and Calgary. Definitely so. So check them out. And uh, once we're able to do it again here in Saskatchewan, uh, Prairie Pro Wrestling Academy will inevitably open up once again. And you can also come and get your training here in Saskatchewan. But in the meantime, if you have to uh, head on out to Alberta to go definitely train with those guys, you're going to get a great experience and a lot of great knowledge from some of the best in the business. So I want to thank everybody for uh, tuning into this great show. I think we had a wonderful time here today and tried something different with this uh, free-for-all at the end, Papa Smokes. I think it turned out well. I really enjoyed it myself. And I want to thank you, the fans, for listening in once again to Ring Respect Radio, uh, checking us out on the Video Bros Network and also on Backbreaker Media as well. Once again, thank you very much for spending your time with us, and we hope you have a good rest of your day.